Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Chrissy B Show. Now, we all want to be healthy and live to a ripe old age, but why are so many people getting it wrong when it comes to their health? And how can they change bad habits around? Well, my guests tonight to discuss this topic are Helen Panzerino, body and mind transformation coach, Kristin Bailey, nutritional consultant and chef, and Professor Adrian Williams, consultant physician of the London Sleep Centre. Now, forget if you want to get in touch at any point during the show to share your views, you can tweet or Facebook us, and you can also call on 020 7686 6300. If you want more information on the show as well, you can visit chrissybshow.tv. So let's get straight into the subject because we've got lots to talk about. So let's introduce our first guest, Helene Panzerino. Hello, Hello. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Great can you tell the, the viewers what you do first of all? Yeah, I would say essentially I'm a body and life transformation expert. Um, I don't mm. want to say that I'm a fitness professional or that I'm a weight loss person because mm. it is really all wrapped up in transforming your attitude mm -hmm. towards healthy food, healthy living, movement, and having okay. a more positive life. Now, you're, you're, what's, can I ask what size you are right now? At the moment, I'm a size eight. <laughs> <laughs> size eight. So you, are, you haven't always been a size eight, have you? In fact, you've brought some of your clothes that yeah. you used to wear. How long ago now, was it? Uh, that was probably about 2006, 2007, Okay, I would say. should we just show yeah, the viewers yeah, here yeah. what, what you used to wear? Yeah, these were my size 22. Okay, let's just hold, right? Nice. Big. So this petite young lady here oh, used to wear these. <laughs> I was carrying. So, so these were size 22. Two. Yeah, there was a lot of junk in my trunk. <laughs> I would say there. Okay. Um, there was also a lot of um, uh, these. A lot. <laughs> let me just hang on. Let me try and. There okay. A, there you go. Can you see that? There was a lot on the bonnet the as well. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. So what happened? Yeah. How did you? So you weren't always that size, were you? No, so you no. were. You started off like quite slim. Yeah, yeah. And then what happened? Why did you put on so much weight? I was, uh, was at a point where I was training for a marathon because I thought, oh, I, I want to actually have a focus for my fitness training. So I was mm -hmm. pretty slim and I was moving around a lot and eating well. Uh, and I suddenly started gaining probably between 10 and 20 pounds a month. That's, um, that's so much. It was a lot. And I was quite small framed. And you were eating normally? Same. Like... Everything was the same. And then my hair started to fall out oh, uh, in large clumps, my eyelashes and mm -hmm. my eyebrows. So it was, and I was very tired. And at the time, I, I, had, I knew that I had a slight thyroid problem anyway, but what I didn't know was that I had a very active form of something called Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune condition related to the thyroid. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it, and no one else knew it for about two and a half years. So but when you started to put on the weight, what did you, how did you react? Did you go and see anyone? Did you speak to your doctor, or did you just think, oh, look, let me go on a diet to lose no, I, d I did go to the doctor. I went straight to the doctor because mm. I, said, I realized that something wasn't right. Um, and I, I hate to say this, but at the time, everyone was just saying, uh, you're sad and maybe your marriage is a problem and how oh, you're having problems yeah. at work. And, and yes, was the answer to every one mm. of those questions, but it was all coming from what was happening to my body, yeah. actually. Not, you know, that there were hormonal changes and other changes, biochemical changes inside me that I wasn't okay. aware of. How, how did you actually feel going from being slim to all of a sudden now putting such large amounts of weight on every yeah. is it month you said? It took, in total, it was about a five year period of time. And after the first two and a half years where I, I did try everything because mm. I was very uncomfortable. I was very upset. I was really sad. So I did Reiki, Chinese medicine. Mm. You know, if it was out there, I was doing it. I probably would have, you know, gone to the ends of the earth, but nothing was working uh, for me. And at the time, other parts of my body were taking over the functions for activity. So my adrenal glands, for example, were working very hard as well. Right. Personally, by the time I got to 18 stone, I felt very depressed, but also very, like I was living in someone else's body. Mm. I didn't know this person. I didn't know well, who I was. Well, from running a marathon, well, ma running marathons, and then all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. And people reacted to me who knew mm. me then and not before as unintelligent, unhygienic, gluttonous. Oh gosh. Uh, very often people would say things like <coughs> beautiful eyes, shame about the body. That's um, terrible, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is actually. It's, people are so cool sometimes. They don't realize what they yeah. do to people when they yeah. say it because the person's already feeling. If they're not, because there are obviously there are people that are happy being large, some people. 
But for those that aren't and, you know, it's due to health problems, comments like that can really destroy the person's self-confidence. We have to be so careful what we say. And people are cruel and it gave yeah. me a great insight into what happens to people on a daily yeah. basis. Um, whether it's their fault or not, or whether it's their, you know, something that's a health condition or, or another reason that they're mm. uh, turning to food for solace and, and getting larger. But it was, it was a real revelation for me yeah. to see the way people were treated. And in my own family, there had been a lot of obesity, but it, it never had touched me yeah. personally. So then I understood how my 42-stone mother right. felt. Exactly, yeah. Or my sister, who was mm -hmm. quite large. And now, obviously, you didn't remain that size because what, what happened... Yeah, you know, it's, I, so the years went on and mm -hmm. things were not working and I sort of, I gave up somewhere around the bacon sandwiches and extra glass of wine <laughs> <laughs> and just became everybody's fat friend <laughs> with long linen robes and dangly uh -huh. earrings as it were. Uh, and then my dad had a brain hemorrhage and mm -hmm. I went to, I questioned whether or not I should get on a plane and go to see him in Florida, which when you can think that something like weight can actually make you stand there and say, my my father is in the hospital potentially dying mm -hmm. and I'm standing in my kitchen wondering if I should go because it's hot and humid in Florida and I don't want to go. So I went for two months. Because of the size? Yeah, the... yeah. I went for two months mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately had to make the decision to, to let him pass in my arms. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to the UK, I thought I really need to try and make something positive out of this experience. Okay. So I'm going to see if I have actually righted myself but there was a moment, almost like an epiphany and a moment of surrender, where I realized that I couldn't fight this condition because it was part of my immune mm -hmm. system. So all the years that I'd been fighting, it had 24 hours to fight back and was always going to win yeah. because I was only awake about six hours a day. Mm -hmm. So in the moment of surrender was actually the release for me that changed everything. And I started to get back into... Um, I, I went to play tennis, to learn to play tennis, wearing this bra, in fact, <laughs> because there were no sports bras oh, uh, yes. <laughs> that would fit me. That must have been painful, though. It was. You don't have, I mean, any, any size person would like, need some kind of support yeah. in playing sports. So yeah. you mind someone larger as well. It was, it was. Gosh. I wore a polo neck top and, and big uh, stretch tracksuit bottoms and hid away yeah. on the Caledonian Road. Yeah. Um, and power walked in Hyde Park for an hour. And I did that probably for about a month and a half until I lost stone, and then I went back into the gym. Okay. Because I was also at the time in my mid to late 40s, and I knew that weight training was important for skin mm -hmm. uh, elasticity as well, and taking care of it also, because you know that size down on a yeah. small frame and on, on mature skin is difficult. So a lot of women stay away from weight training. I keep yeah, telling my no. friends, you need to do weight yeah, training. Don't get scared yeah. of getting big muscles because you won't. You're just going to tone up. Yeah. Keep telling them. Yeah. Now you can hear it from the expert as well. There yeah. you go. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and ironically, I mean, most people wouldn't want to be, you know, maybe as toned as I am, but mm. every day oh, people <laughs> ask me about my arms <laughs> yeah. and they don't come. We were talking about arms last week, actually. We were saying, no, we can't seem to get rid of that no matter how slim the person gets. But yeah, I should just do the arm workout. Yeah. That would be my <laughs> you know that might be the answer to it because I do teach Zumba classes but they don't come from Zumba classes mm -hmm. oh tell us about the Zumba, Zumba class oh, you teach Zumba celebrities classes. don't you I do in in the 50 days to my 50th birthday I did 50 different things on each of the days oh and on two of great. them I got my Zumba qualification uh -huh. uh, and then I got a call from a director who was looking to help one of the big brother winners mm -hmm. lose weight um Josie Gibson at the time yeah uh, and so she we was quite large. She was, she, yeah. yeah, yeah. She was, and and there was so much, uh, you know, that she hadn't exercised in a long time, and nutrition was was a question. So we devised an overall plan for her mm -hmm. that was food and activity based, uh, with a view to a DVD. Right. Um, and then we did the follow up program. What happened to, to Josie and John James? Mm -hmm. um, and then she went down to about a size twelve, I think. That's great. Um, so she's she's had a few moments, but yeah, that yeah. that was the start of my. Uh, celebrity training yeah. <laughs> it must be really interesting though it's very interesting <laughs> it's not always easy yeah, I, I can imagine. <laughs> to motivate someone to get up at the crack of dawn when they're used to you know staying out until the crack of dawn <laughs> is but what, what I found interesting as well about what you do is that you look at the psychological aspect of things so it's not just sort of the physical or the fitness or anything yeah. you incorporate much more than that. Can you tell yeah. us about that? In fact, yes, because I don't, I don't, if you haven't exercised and you, and you come to me on the Renaissance uh, Woman program, I would say to people, don't even think about it if for three weeks, four weeks, if you've not exercised. It's not the first mm. thing that comes into play for me. I understood and I've come to, to see with the people who've gone on the program that often 
it's not because people are hungry that they eat. Yeah, I might move three hours a day, but most people don't. Mm -hmm. There's something else that they're using food to substitute for. So whether it's relationships or yeah. money problems, jobs you don't like, maybe you don't like where you live. So there's, mm -hmm. it's addressing those problems. And if I can't deal with them, if they're much deeper than that, sometimes there are issues of abuse or abandonment, and then I have to bring in a professional who can help people there. Because there's a direct... That is the first step, isn't it? Because it is. even if you yeah. are to lose weight, but you still have those issues, yeah. as soon as you lose the weight, you're going to go back to exactly. having that unhealthy relationship with, with food exactly. again. You need to figure out how you got there in the first place. And, mm -hmm. and it can be very painful to, to deal with that, really. Mm -hmm. It's rare that someone, I think... I mean, it's probably more common now with all the different uh, allergies and different um, processed foods and things that are, we're reacting with. But most of the time, it's not to do with a physical condition. There may be an mm -hmm. underlying condition. But there's always another trigger, and it's getting to that trigger first of all, and then that releases or turns off. You know, mm -hmm. you, you hold fat, and you need to flick the switch that will release the fat programs to work for you. And mm -hmm. there'll be, you know, I know you'll speak later on to other people about how stress and the other biochemical things come into play. Mm -hmm. So once people have addressed and acknowledged that, then we can get on with education about food, nutrient-rich food, supplementation, and I educate people so they make the choice. There's no diet. There's no plan that is but prescriptive. But that, that sounds wonderful, like no diet, because <coughs> I don't like diets. No. I and don't like being deprived of food ever. No, and it's, it's like <laughs> so that. It's, it's if you deprive somebody, yeah. yeah, then they're just going to want it more. Yeah. And, and I want people to learn, because there's quite a bit of ignorance. And, and not, I don't know that it's actually, it's just probably in our school systems and in, in other ways in, in the country now. People mm. are not very aware of what nutrients are in food yeah. or why a 141 calorie taco is not the same as a 141 calorie piece of uh, wild salmon, uh, mm. you know, in terms of the way that, that we process it. So by educating people and working with nutritionists and with naturopaths, mm. people then start to make the choices and over a period of, say, 20 to 30 days, they, they get physical changes that make them not crave the same foods really? they did before. That's really good. Hmm. So then they're That's making the choices. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm not making the choices. And then they want to move more. But I'm mm -hmm. there for them to speak to by phone or by email or mm -hmm. in person. Pretty much, you know, some people it's five times a week, some people it's three times a week. And they can email me almost as if yeah. I were their diary or their journal. That's nice. And I know sometimes people, older people that say they have a health condition or they, they might sometimes think, well, I'm not really going to bother because I have this health condition. I've heard, you know, when you're over a certain age, it's really difficult to lose weight, almost impossible. How, how can we help people like yeah, that? Funnily enough, I'm dealing with some of the menopausal issues myself. Oh, <laughs> the new okay. challenge, the new challenge <laughs> is that because I really would like people to stay as natural as possible and to use their diet and supplements to help them through these things. You know, before mm -hmm. we had patches and, and everything else, people, women were doing this for centuries. So yeah. let's get back to, to what, you know, some of the basics really. And I don't want women to give up. I don't want mm -hmm. them to just accept that you know, things are going to expand and they're going to, be going to become invisible and, and they're going to have that blank look in their faces. I think it's a mental thing as well because if, if everyone's saying it, because I, I, I remember when I was at uni, we used to have a, a gym instructor. I think she was probably in her late 50s. She had a fantastic body. And it's like, she, you know, she was always training and everything. So I think because we keep hearing, oh, you know, you, when you get older, you're going to put on weight. It's like we kind of let go. Exactly. And we just, yeah. we just yeah. think, oh, it's going to happen yeah. anyway, so yeah. I'm not going to bother. And if yeah. you put on a bit, I'm not going to bother yeah. losing it because yeah. I'm not going to be able to lose it. Yeah. So I think we just get into that yeah. cycle, don't we? Yeah, yeah. You buy into what, it, what is common yeah. folklore, really. I do do visualizations and affirmations with people. And I think mm -hmm. for me, it's, it's, a, it's a, you can call it mindfulness, you can call it meditation, you can just mm -hmm. call it the visualization. Every morning and every night, that's how I begin and end my day. Mm -hmm. And I record them for other people, for some of the clients, right. so that they can do the same thing. And you need to keep that positive reinforcement going and to mm -hmm. visualize the body that you want or the life that you want yeah. repeatedly. And it does make a difference. When I've done the trials with people, the people who use the affirmations and the visualizations mm -hmm. do better than the people who don't. Okay, it's it's better to imagine something you can actually go for what you want and obese children as well because it's I know like oh, in America it's a huge problem over yeah. here it's getting bad yeah. as well how can we yeah. help obese children yeah I do a lot of work uh, I'm an ambassador for diabetes UK and actually this is the first time that we have di type 2 so lifestyle diabetes in children in the UK mm. so it Gosh. is becoming a big problem 
And today I was just speaking with a national organization about rolling out a course that involves parents with, with um, a parenting trainer mm -hmm. uh, and a nutritionist and myself to talk about food activity and strategies for parents to be able to use and employ to do this as a family. Mm -hmm. So family activities, family meals, yeah. you know, to, to work together, to try and approach it from that angle. Because I really don't believe if you beat people up with this, it's not going to no, change not anything. All. Not at all. So you have to come in from the inside. Right. It's been so interesting talking to you, Helene, but we've run mm. out of time, oh. unfortunately. But well, thank you so much. And her Pleasure. details will be up on our website, Chris, chrissybishow.tv. I need to forgot the website again. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Pleasure. Thank okay, you. so after the break, we'll have Christine Bailey, nutritional consultant and chef. And she's brought a few little treats mm. for us to, well, for me to try. And I'll tell you what it's like. And that's after this break. So join us then. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show. We're talking about keeping you in top form. We've already had some great advice from our first guest, and now we've also got Christine Bailey, who's a nutritional consultant and chef. So good evening and thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you, Chrissy. It's lovely to be here. <laughs> so tell us about what you do, first of all. Well, I'm a nutritional um, consultant, but I'm also a qualified chef as well. So mm -hmm. I, the nice thing is that I can combine um, nutritional support for clients and also practical help. So I write a whole range of recipe books. I run cooking mm -hmm. demos um, for the public and also practitioners and GPs. I go into schools, do healthy eating, um, and obviously see clients as well. So mm -hmm. it's a nice combination because, as you were saying with Elaine, that you need more than just knowing about food yeah. and what to eat. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to it than that. It's a lot more complex, mm -hmm. and certainly the new recipe book that I've got out looks at the underlying imbalances in people's body systems and how mm -hmm. you can actually address those rather than just the signs and symptoms that people might have which may include um, obesity or, mm -hmm. or having difficulty losing weight. Um, there's quite often underlying imbalances that need to be addressed as well. Mm. Now go, going into schools, how receptive mm. are like school children? And, oh, they love and, it. Really? Absolutely love it, yeah. When yeah. they are shown practical examples of how to cook and new mm -hmm. foods, um, we've done quite a lot of cooking days with them where we've had say 90 children. Um, yeah. And we've done a day on Greek food, for example, or mm. on ancient Romans and what they would eat. And we'd always incorporate that into healthy eating and give them little messages through the day. And then we'd end up with them all eating the food together. Oh, I nice. mean, it's just, yeah. it's just wonderful. So, mm -hmm. um, and I've written quite a lot of books on finger food, on baby foods, on foods for brainy kids and things like that. And the idea is, is to make food practical um, but also obviously nutritious and tasty as well. Because that's, that's a common myth, isn't it? That you know, if you eat healthily, it's going to be boring yeah. and people don't want to, a lot of people are quite resistant yes. to eating healthily, but they don't actually realise just how yummy healthy food absolutely, is. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that's what we try and do in our cooking days and mm. in the practical support that we give people. It's looking at well, what key nutrients do you need to optimise your body. It's not mm. about empty calories. It's not about calorie counting, to be honest. So I'm loving that. Because it's just, <laughs> just almost like you don't have to count calories. because no. that's just and that's not what we do. We don't yeah. do calories. Mm -hmm. We're looking at, well, what are the nutrients that your body needs? And we're all different. Mm -hmm. And the new book, um, which is about functional nutrition. What is functional nutrition? Well, functional nutrition is a patient-centred approach. Mm -hmm. Rather than looking at the disease or the condition that someone comes to you with, we're looking at the patient and we're looking at the fact that actually your health is related to all the choices that you've made over your lifetime of your diet, of your lifestyle, and how those wow. are interacted with your own genes. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a diet that fits everyone. Everyone is different. And so a functional nutritionist will look at those underlying imbalances and say, well, what stresses have you had in your life? Mm. Have you had lots of events that have triggered certain imbalances in your body? And we see health as a continuum. So you might start off with optimal health and then there may be subtle imbalances or deficiencies which could lead to dysfunction mm -hmm. and ultimately linked to um, you know, a disease. Um, and at any stage in that continuum, you can change your diet 
you can change your lifestyle. <laughs> and that's actually very proactive. So it gives people a feeling of control that actually there is things that I can do. And um, it must be quite disheartening for someone that, you know, they, they're eating healthily, for yeah. example. They think, well, I'm doing everything right yeah, and exactly. I, I still feel like this. I still, mm. I'm still putting on weight. What's going yeah. on with my body? And that's why um, we also use things like lab testing. So, mm. um, I mean, a classic, we, we, you mentioned about the thyroid, but another classic is the fact of stress and what stress does to the body. Mm. And let's face it, these days, everyone has a hectic lifestyle. Yeah. Everyone is constantly under stress. And what that does is actually demand quite a lot of your adrenal glands, which is where we produce our stress hormones. Mm -hmm. And one of those stress hormones is cortisol. And over time, our body ends up getting quite worn out about producing all this cortisol. Mm -hmm. And that in itself can create nutritional deficiencies in the body, but it can also lead to problems with blood sugar. And of Gosh. course, if we've got problems with blood sugar, that can lead to metabolic syndrome and diabetes. But also, effect, isn't it? absolutely, yeah. and also if you've got a blood sugar problem, you're probably going to start craving those carbs. Mm. You're probably going to start wanting those calorie fixes, those, those quick fixes of caffeine or chocolate. And, you know, the body will respond by saying, I'm under stress and I need to hold on to those reserves, so I'm going to dump it as fat. And so often Gosh. what you find is someone who's adrenally stressed mm -hmm. will end up with a bit of a belly. And that's often a classic sign of adrenal stress. Mm. But there's other signs as well. And, and, and what we tend to do is look at all the signs and symptoms of that person, maybe combine it again with some lab testing, and mm. then devise a plan to help them cope with that. And that might be with diet changes. It might be with supplements. But often it's also looking at lifestyle. Because mm. it's all very well eating right. But if you are manic and you're stressed out constantly, there's so much diet can do. It's mm. got to be a whole lifestyle approach. And if, if you are that stress, what kind of food can you eat mm. to, to help? Say, obviously, you can't, you can't test anyone now, but... No, say absolutely, if, if, if you, no. So, I mean, you if, you, if you are stressed to the point that, you know, you're feeling so exhausted that you're struggling to get out of bed mm. um, and you are having muscle aches or energy dips and, and panic attacks and so on, the chances are that your adrenals are not producing sufficient cortisol to keep you going. Mm -hmm. And what the temptation is to do is to reach for the caffeine, because that will perk you up, or reach for the chocolate, or reach for sugary foods. And that's exactly what you shouldn't do, because really? obviously oh, that's gosh. playing <laughs> you know, to the fact that your Mistake blood sugar is all over the place. <laughs> So what yeah. we tend to advise is things like um, high protein foods to mm. keep you satiated so you don't get those cravings. Low glycemic foods, that's things like the whole grains. But also we look at, well, what nutrients does the adrenal need? The adrenal needs a lot of magnesium. Mm -hmm. The adrenals need a lot of vitamin C, a lot of B5. So foods rich in those, so a lot of meat and poultry, whole grains, nuts and seeds, yeah. avocado. And of course, those are things that people say, oh, no, I shouldn't eat those. I'll put on weight if I eat mm -hmm. those sort of fats. But actually, those are healthy fats, which are yeah. very nourishing for the body, mm -hmm. which is why I said earlier, you know, we don't do calories. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what I've got well, here yeah, today, because so we, we some, sort of... Some of this stuff looks really yummy, Yes. Yeah, so what What's we've got today about? is, um, <laughs> I thought I'd bring in a few things so that people, you know, can get practical ideas of mm -hmm. what to include. And what I've made here for you is a raw cacao and maca fudge, which is yes. high protein, no right. sugar. So, um, so try a bit of that. So that's a sort of... Um, now this looks like chocolate. Well, absolutely. It's and, and it's raw cacao, which is a form of chocolate, high in antioxidants. But it's got something called mm. maca in there. And I don't know how familiar people texture. are with maca. Mm -hmm. um, but maca is a Peruvian root vegetable. And is that it's, in here? Yeah, that's in there. Mm, it's got nice. a slight butterscotchy flavour. Mm -hmm. And it's commonly, it was commonly used by the Peruvians for energy and endurance. And what we now know through um, chemical studies on it, it contains various alkaloids which actually support the adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. So it's perfect for those times that you feel stressed. Um, it's used a lot by athletes actually because athletes are quite prone to overtraining. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a stress on the body. Um, and the other nice thing about this for us women is that it helps to balance sex hormones, so mm -hmm. estrogen and progesterone, and also testosterone. So it's actually quite useful for 
perimenopause and menopause mm. as well. So it's a wonderful superfood. It's and really you can delicious. get it in all... Where does the sweetness come from? So that's dates, just mm. some dates. And it's got high protein in, so sometimes we might use a bit of protein powder, but actually that one's just got walnuts in. Mm. And, and, and walnuts, of course, have omega-3s in, so that's very good for cognitive function, for brain function. Yeah. So it's perfect. Because often See, when people that say that healthy food isn't nice. <laughs> if you could taste this, honestly, it's, it's, it's really in delicious. the recipe book. It's so, lovely. yeah, and, and mm. you know, it's... And I mean, I made that actually, I've got three children and I made that for the twins' birthday and they just absolutely loved it, yeah. you know. That Can I have that instead of brownies? Absolutely. It looks <laughs> and because it's mm -hmm. high protein, you're not going to get that sugar dip mm -hmm. that you might do if you went for a standard yeah. chocolate bar, Because there's always example. a time of the day where I really fancy something sweet. So normally I'll have my lunch and then I'll have mm. to have like a little chocolate. Yeah. Then I have my dinner and I have my cup of tea and then I always want a cake afterwards. So, so this is what you need to make. That's what my I need to make. <laughs> I have to get the recipe for them. So, I mean, so you can, I mean, you don't have to include superfoods in the diet. You know, mm. by choosing foods that are rich in the nutrients that your body needs, you know, you don't have to spend a fortune either because a lot of people say, oh, superfoods are really expensive. Mm. Actually, you know, you can choose healthy, lean protein and unprocessed foods. In a way, going away from packaged food and to food as nature intended, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains. You know, Sometimes it's, so, it's just so much easier just to grab something. It is. Something unhealthy. It is. So we just have to kind of re-educate ourselves. And, and that's where I think, you know, having the sort of chef's qualification and doing cooking days for mm. people really helps because um, my recipe books are always uncomplicated. It's always food that you can do quickly but will taste great yeah. because... I've got three kids, I work full time, I haven't got time to spend ages in the kitchen, you know. And I, it's got to be practical, otherwise, like you say, people aren't going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also got to taste nice yeah. as well. Um, so the other couple of things that I thought I'd bring in, this one is um, it's something called coconut water. And I don't know if you've come across coconut water. I've been buying that lately, actually, oh, 100%. Yeah, because I, I really you. like your friend gave it to me the other day, and I normally don't like it because... The other brands that I bought have sugar in it. Right. It's too yes. sweet. No, but no. I found we found like 100% pure. There are. Why is it red though? So that one's got some pomegranate in, oh, I love um, pomegranate which well. is a really high antioxidant. And of course, when you are stressed, mm. often your body's actually getting attacked. It's getting free radical attack. So mm. you need high levels of vitamin C and antioxidants. Now, the reason I've chosen coconut water today is one of the problems with the adrenals is when they don't work well, they also affect our sodium and potassium levels because they mm -hmm. affect a hormone called allosterone. And so we end up, if they're not working well, often excreting quite a lot of sodium. Mm -hmm. And what you find is that some people that are extremely stressed end up saying they crave salt. Um, some people crave sugar. Other people mm -hmm. say, do you know what? I just crave crisps all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because there's an imbalance of sodium and potassium. Now, coconut water is a brilliant electrolyte drink, and that's why a lot of athletes use it as well, mm. because it has a good balance of sodium, magnesium, and potassium. And so you feel instantly well. hydrated. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it tastes great. That it's, it's more hydrating than water, is that true? It is, absolutely, wow. because it's got those electrolytes in there. Mm. So if you need something to quickly perk you up, again, rather than going for the sugary drinks, you can get either plain coconut water, which is that one, or yeah. the, the, the fruit-flavoured ones, and they don't have extra sugar in, it's just mm. natural fruits. So they're absolutely fantastic. I'm going down the right road. There, you are. I? <laughs> well done. And again, you see, yeah. something easy that people can just pick up. And those are available in supermarkets mm -hmm. now. You know, it's not as if you have to go to little health shops or anything. Yeah. These are all widely available. And then again, it's got to be available. And again, great for children's lunch yeah, boxes. You really know, if they don't really like water, that's much better than a, a squash or a fruit juice, mm -hmm. for example. So it is easy to fit these in as well. Really yummy. And this, this one here. So this other one I brought in because I've also included it in here. One of the things that a lot of people get really confused about is fats. Mm -hmm. Because um, a lot of people are still on the impression that they have to be on a low-fat diet. Now, actually, our bodies need fat. We need the I right love sort. This show today. <laughs> it's just, you know, you know we need the right more. healthy fat. It's true. And um, <laughs> this one is um, something that's quite unusual. It's called chia seeds. Mm -hmm. And um, chia are one of the best sources of omega 3 um, fatty acids. And omega 3 are really essential for cell membrane function. 
And if you normally find in salmon and things like absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, if you're a vegetarian or vegan and you don't want to eat fish, that sort of leaves you, you know, short really. Mm. Um, there's flax seeds, there's walnuts, there's pumpkin seeds. This one's actually higher in omega threes. Um, and gram for gram, it's actually got eight times more than a piece of salmon. Amazingly, wow, yeah. yeah. Um, and chia seeds are also very good for digestive health as well. One thing you find with a lot of people is that actually their digestion really needs a lot of support. Mm -hmm. um, when you're stressed, often you find you end up with you know bowel complaints, spasms, abdominal pains. I've got a friend actually that she hardly goes to yeah, the toilet. Constipated. Yeah, constipated. Yeah, but constantly she's like. I don't, know, and I don't know what she's taking for it, but she's, yeah. sometimes a whole week goes by and she can't go. Well, these are one of the best sources of soluble fibre. I hope she's watching. Um, I won't so say your name. <laughs> <laughs> but and, I hope you're um, watching. You need to get some These of this you stuff. can add to your breakfast cereal. Mm. You can add to oh, your you can porridge. Have you can sprinkle them over or you can grind them up, put them in smoothies. We often mm. use them in smoothies. But they also will thicken because they... Um, are soluble fibre, they absorb oh, lots right. of water, okay. which is why they're so useful. How much would you need to have to make a difference? Oh, literally a teaspoon. I mean, really? they just really swell up, yes. Wow. So you just soak them in water and then you'll see it almost like a gel. Mm -hmm. And then you can add that to a smoothie or a shake or just sprinkle it in your porridge. You can also grind them up, use them in things like yeah. the bars as well. Yummy. So again, a really easy way of getting them in. Um, and other fats that we often recommend are obviously nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. avocados, very nutritious, coconut Jello. oil. Coconut yeah. oil is fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a medium chain triglyceride, preferentially burnt for the body, for energy. Again, athletes use it a lot. And again, it, it gets a bad press. You know, fats do get a bad press, mm -hmm. but actually our bodies are crying out for healthy fats. So there you go, everyone. If you did think that healthy food was boring, it's <laughs> not. There's some delicious stuff here. You can have coconut oil. Absolutely. <laughs> that's stuff. So that's, that's really refreshing. Thank you so much, Christine, for your advice. Thank you. And I'm really going to get the recipe for those because they are <laughs> delicious. I'm not just saying it because we're on TV. I'm really, I really do mean it. <laughs> so thank, thank you very you. much. It's lovely, Christine. So after the break, we'll have... Um, who do we have after break? Sorry, the, let me see. Oh, sorry. Yes, Professor Adrian Winners is coming on after the sh after the break, and he'll be speaking about the importance of sleep, and he'll also be explaining the connection between the lack of sleep and obesity as well. So, if you think one had nothing to do with the other, you're very wrong, and he'll be explaining to us why after this. Welcome back to the Chrissy Show, and we've actually finished all the fudge because <laughs> everyone in the studio wants to try one, and like we've had a couple of these each. But anyway, if you want, if you want the recipe, you're just going to have to find out for yourself. So before we introduce our next guest, we do have our places to visit section, and this time Barbara and Joanna went to visit a place in Oxford, which was an old prison. So if you're into your history and into being a bit scared, you probably like this place very much. Take a look. Welcome to Oxford Castle Unlocked. My name is Anne Green and I will be your guide as we delve back in time into the mysteries of this ancient site. I was a prisoner at this castle 350 years ago. These two students here would have traveled from all corners of the Christendom to be taught by the Norman scholars. So famed was their knowledge and intelligence. And it was they who would have built all of Oxford's colleges, or at least the earlier ones. So apparently this is the D-wing, this is where lots of cells in a line here where all the prisoners used to be kept and apparently it was like more than one, it would be actually maybe three and possibly even more in its earlier years. 
There is much more to find out about Oxford Castle and Knot than meets the eye. And of course, especially the stories of the Civil War, you should be very interested in that sort of thing when King Charles unfortunately eventually surrendered Oxford to the parliamentarians. But uh, we've more than the prisoners, we've all the education that you've just heard about. We've the stories of Roland Jenks, we've the story of Matilda, and even King John, who was here in the 1200s. All this is very important and many parts of our history are somehow linked to Oxford. So perhaps one should even go and look at our website, www.oxfordcastleandlock.co.uk, as far as I know. That's great. Thanks a lot for taking us around today. We've had a great time. Lots of history here and lots of people to come and see. It's quite scary, though. I do hope Miss Green didn't try to hang you herself or something of that sort. Well, I'm still alive, but I don't know where the other one is. Ooh. Mm. Yes, well, we'll have to see about that. <laughs> well, I'm happy to say that Joanna did make it back safely after all. So now we all know um, how great we feel after a good night's sleep, but why is sleep so important to our health? And joining us now to talk about this is Professor Adrian Williams, and he's going to be telling us about the connection between the lack of sleep and being overweight. Aren't you, Professor? There's, there's <laughs> actually a, ve a very clear relationship. And the best way of, um, of explaining it would be to describe what happens when people are forced to have less sleep than is normal, mm -hmm. for example, four or six hours a night. And in that situation, those people will end up with an increased appetite. And it's actually thinking to what your other presenters were saying, that, that, um, that actually relate, has, it's, it's more um, fat and carbohydrate that people prefer to eat mm -hmm. if they've not slept enough. And the science behind it is that there are two hormones which are related to our appetite. One suppresses appetite, it's called leptin, it's generated by our fat cells. Mm -hmm. And the other is um, something called ghrelin, which stimulates appetite, and that's produced by the stomach. And in a sleep-deprived situation, they go in the opposite direction, so that leptin levels go down and therefore appetite increases, mm -hmm. and ghrelin levels go up, so appetite increases. And so there is a drive to eat. Um, you know, perhaps that makes sense if someone hasn't been asleep and they need more energy. But nevertheless, there is an increased appetite with lack of sleep. Now, that's the sort of um, the, 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 the experimental situation. But you can extend that to examples we were hearing tonight of mm -hmm. stress, which would reduce or make sleep less uh, less effic efficient, yeah. um, or other things that might happen at night that disturb sleep. That mm. leads to an increase in appetite that's almost um, inescapable. Even though people may deny it, they, they do eat more. Mm -hmm. How much sleep should a person be getting then, on average? Um, yes, because sometimes it's varies. So sometimes I hear five and a half hours is the minimum, yeah, and then okay. or six and a half. So what, what would you recommend? Well, that's the perennial question. <laughs> and it, the, the, the straight answer is 8.1 hours. Now, how did that oh. come to be <laughs> known? Well, the, the, that was a study done in America, taking a, a group, a large group of young, healthy people like yourselves, and mm -hmm sending them to, to Bermuda and allowing them to sleep as much as they wanted to. And the first few days they slept Who'd want for to sleep in Bermuda? nine or <laughs> ten hours and then it oh. all settled down to an average of eight mm -hmm. hours. Now that's an average and so that, that means that there are 50% of people who need more and 50% right. who need less. But I heard any more than nine and it starts to affect your, your memory. Uh, <laughs> no, no, if you need, the amount of sleep you need is what you need. And it's inescapable. Right. It's, it's actually an inherited amount. There's mm -hmm. a familial trait to how much we need to sleep. Um, I know where your question comes from. It's um, that m more sleep, like too little sleep, uh, leads to an early death. Mm -hmm. But um, that's confounded by so many other things. Right. Um, you really need to just look at your parents as to how much you need to sleep. It's what they sleep to they, maintain. Well, they wake up at four in the morning to go fishing and crazy things like that, but they do go to bed quite early. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be doing that. <laughs> okay, so tell us, if, if a person is having a bit of trouble sleeping or they're waking up during the night, what's the, what's the best thing to do to get a really good night's sleep? Because everyone does need it. Yes, again, the, 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 the common question. And the basis of... of, of 
getting a good night's sleep is to do all the things that we all know are right um, mm -hmm. and to avoid the things that are not right. So it's that thing called sleep hygiene. That's an unfortunate phrase, but nevertheless... Yeah, I've never um, heard that before today, like sleep hygiene. It's yes, an it's, interesting it's, it's, term. It's, 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 you know, paying attention to good things and, and avoiding bad things. So mm -hmm. the examples would be avoiding caffeine later in the day because that's quite a potent stimulant. Exercise is extremely good for sleep and it works actually in a quite a physiological way. Um, it's not because we're fit that we sleep well, but it's because we raise body temperature and temperature is right. a drive to sleep. And so the, um, the perfect situation is that not to exercise in the morning because you lose the temperature Which is what in, I did in the day this morning. or in the <laughs> evening because adrenaline levels will disturb sleep. Oh. But it's been found to be best between 4 and 7 p.m. All oh, right, okay. Now, not ideal for working people. <laughs> Now this group here, actually not ideal at all, <laughs> no. but um, uh, that's, that, that's the way that it, it's, you know, it, it works best. Mm -hmm. A half an hour of aerobic exercise, not walking the dog, it's no. sweating, okay. but generating temperature. So that's a good thing. Um, some food in the stomach is probably a good thing before bed. Um, a room which is cool and dark. Bats are fantastic sleepers and they're cold, dark caves. I prefer cold because my husband likes the, the bedroom with the heating on and I hate oh. it because it's like I can't sleep. I like a nice sort of cool room so we have to kind of find a compromise, I'm something in between. <laughs> I know, it's just uh, maybe it's because it's from a you know, hot country, I don't know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I find it quite hard to, to sleep in that kind of yeah. temperature. But these simple things do actually make a difference and it's, um, I think it surprises people that the attention to the simpler things mm -hmm. does help. And I have to say one final thing, which people never really appreciate, or hardly ever. If you wake up at night, you check the time, because you need to know how much more time you have yes, in bed. Yes, do we do well, that? I do that, but at the moment <laughs> it's not a problem for me. But if it's a problem where you do wake up repeatedly at the same time, you just need to avoid that time cue. I mean, it really is a drive mm -hmm. to continuing to wake up at that time. It's the strangest thing. But how do you, how do you avoid that if you just wake up anyway? Well, you, can't? you just you know, grind your teeth and bite the bullet and just don't look at the clock okay. or get rid of the clock. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so tell us some of the, the most common um, sleep problems that people have. And perhaps yes, these have um, the, um, it's, uh, sleep complaints are probably the commonest in medical practice. Mm -hmm. Insomnia, of course, people are not sleeping well. But then being excessively sleepy and coming back to the theme of your program of, of appetite and e eating and the obesity epidemic may be laid, well, our, uh, we enthusiasts think is mm -hmm. laid at the foot of, of sleep and sleep disturbance like snoring and sleep apnea, which are mm -hmm. very common in men, particularly as we get older, but women yeah. also. Um, Can you just explain what that is? Sleep well, snoring, I think everyone would know, is that nasty noise that, that emanates that from, a, from, a, from a person who's sleeping. Mm -hmm. But that's a sign that the breathing passage is narrowed, to allowing the, the uvula and soft palate to create mm -hmm. the noise. And uh, that can extend to the, the breathing passage closing off. Mm -hmm. So you, in fact, have what I think of as a continuum. Um, down one end, someone who snores and it doesn't bother anybody, to somebody at the other end who cannot breathe and sleep at the mm. same time. And so we tend to move down this as we grow older and fatter. Um, <laughs> Although we don't necessarily uh, have to get fat as we get older, as we've learned already. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, that's true. No, no, no. Well, I'm an example of that. Yeah, I'm yeah aging, of course, yeah. I'm terribly <laughs> fat. <laughs> um, but so sleep apnea is one of the common things that mm -hmm. disturbs sleep. A quarter of men my age certainly have it up to some degree. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then other things like restless legs, which... Uh, what is that? Because I've got this thing, this habit, I'm not in pain or anything, but I always like to shake my foot when I'm sleeping or just before I'm... Ah. And my mum used to, like, I've done it since I was a child, but it's just sort of, just feels nice, just comforting, but it's not because my legs are in pain or anything. Is that not normal? Mm. <laughs> just that's what thought I'd ask you. Mm. Okay. Well, um, this is a very it's a new, new condition that they've never heard of. <laughs> uh, the, um, I'm not sure that that would um, be restless legs. So we need to talk more about it. But right. it is an uncomfortable feeling, usually, 
in mm. the thighs or maybe the calves that makes you want to move the leg yeah. and, that, and that relieves the discomfort. And it's associated in most cases with legs which kick and twitch while you're asleep. No, I don't think I do that. And that disturbs <laughs> sleep. Yeah. Um, coming back to this theme of um, you know, poor sleep and, and, and mm -hmm. appetite. Okay, so I mean, I'm really liking the show today because so far we're here and we don't have to count calories, that we can eat lots of yummy food, that we can sleep and not feel guilty about it because oh, yes. I, I was thinking if I get about six hours, it's fine, but now I'm going to start trying to get eight hours. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. But thank you so much, Professor, it's for your advice. Mm -hmm. And I do hope, you know, that if you, actually if you're not getting any sleep, you really should um, speak to someone about it. There's lots of professionals to help you, like the professor here. And, you know, you can find out what's going on because, as, you, as you've heard, you do really need to get a good night's sleep for your health. So thank you so much for joining okay. us. And on Wednesday's show, we'll be all talking about sex addiction. But for now, let's leave you with this funny, um, funny YouTube video. Actually, I think it's about signs, signs that are a bit strange. So take a look at this and see. I don't know why people put these kind of signs up, but let's finish here. And we'll see you again on Wednesday's show. Bye for now.